This is Nursing Australia, proudly brought to you by APNA, the Australian Primary Healthcare Nurses Association. Hello and welcome to Nursing Australia. I'm Matthew St. Ledger. Thanks for joining us on this latest instalment of the podcast. Let's flick the spotlight on nurses as we bring you a fascinating story from the front line of the vaccine rollout. I saw my uncle and auntie work in SARS, but I never imagined myself work in as a nurse in the pandemic. And it's time to hear what our nurses are saying as we examine the results from the latest nursing workforce survey. The most common issue impacting nurses really is the low supply of COVID-19 vaccine. And it's finally time to introduce the APNA Conference Roadshow for 2021 and discover how scholarships can link you to a rewarding career in regional and remote health. It really enables health professionals to connect with others who are also working rural, uh, rural or remote. And if you are listening on Apple or Google Podcasts, please don't forget to tap the subscribe button and on Spotify, click to follow. Let's dive straight in with the latest in healthcare news. The federal budget to bolster aged care and women's health. India faces a new threat as it continues to head towards 1 million COVID deaths and global nurses impacted by the COVID effect. This is Nursing Australia News. Hello, I'm Casey Mannix. The federal budget has included vital funding boosts for aged care and women's health initiatives. As part of the government's response to the suite of Royal Commission recommendations, $17.7 billion is pledged to reform the beleaguered aged care sector over the next five years. Women's Health, meanwhile, will receive $354 million towards cervical and breast cancer screening services, better mental health services for new and expectant parents, and endometriosis pain management programs. The Prime Minister called the Royal Commission into aged care quality and safety. It revealed shocking cases of neglect and abuse. Tonight, we commit $17.7 billion in targeted and practical new funding to significantly improve the system. Yeah. We will fund another 80,000 new home care packages, bringing the total to 275,000 home care packages that will be available. We will increase the time nurses and carers are required to spend with residents. We will make an additional payment of $10 per resident per day to enhance the viability and sustainability of the residential aged care system. We will support over 33,000 new training places for personal carers and a new Indigenous workforce. We will provide retention bonuses to keep more nurses in aged care. We will increase the respite services for, for carers, and we will strengthen the regulatory regime to monitor and enforce standards of care. We will upgrade essential aged care infrastructure in regional and remote areas around the country. Latest figures suggest India will reach 1 million COVID deaths by August as it continues to battle its second COVID wave. Doctors are reporting a surge in deadly black fungus infections, which they believe are linked to an increasingly immunocompromised society. Experts fear India's surging daily COVID cases expose the population to the fungal infection known as mucomycosis. Meanwhile, the International Nurses Council are reporting the nursing profession is being negatively impacted by the COVID effect. Not only is the pandemic delaying the education of student nurses, but it's impairing the ongoing education of nurses already in the workforce. It also appears the COVID effect is making nurses rethink their career choice due to perceived poor salary and working conditions. And in the US, a study undertaken by Ohio State University College of Nursing revealed that nurse well-being is directly linked to clinical errors. Nurses in poor mental and physical health are more likely to make preventable clinical errors. 
We know nurses will do anything they can to serve their communities. We overcame the insane year that was 2020, and now in 2021, we once again faced with a whole new set of challenges. We are introducing the Nurse Spotlight segments into Nursing Australia to highlight some of your stories. And to kick things off, we caught up with Lin Lin, a Sydney-based nurse vaccinator who was kind enough to share her pandemic and rollout experience on the front line. Here is Lin Lin's story. When I was in high school, I, I went through SARS, but uh, I saw my uncle and auntie work in SARS, but I never imagined myself work in as a nurse in the pandemic. My name is Lin Lin. Um, I work as a practice nurse in Northbridge Medical Practice. So in March 2020, you know, we didn't know what to do when the COVID patients come in, when they get out the Ruby Princess, we don't know what's, what's going on. And then we got into the stage, okay, we know what to do now. We all gone up, we know where to divert them to. And then we got into a, a good stage, you know, everyone wear a mask, everyone hand hygiene really good. And then uh, towards the end of the year, there was a message got sent out okay we're gonna have a vaccine the Pfizer are gonna be available AstraZeneca gonna be available they're gonna be other vaccine gonna be available like a doctor and i we kind of have a mixed feeling we're sort of like here we are we're gonna hit into a really hard working year again but on the other side we just don't know how this is gonna work so like how we're gonna do this massive immunization program so we set up a COVID vaccination clinic in a spare office area. The idea is per hour, we should be able to get 10 to 15 patients vaccinated. But if we're doing every single day, that's make it um, become like 800 a week. But currently, the government allocate us 400 dollars which is half our maximum capacity. We, we are not working as the full capacity. We are a little bit short of staff. Another thing is the government haven't been allocated us that many vaccines to us. Um, another thing is, I think we have a little bit pushback from the patient, from this um, concern about the side effects of the vaccine itself. That's I think that's the three main reasons. So the for the AstraZeneca clotting things, I think there's mainly the I have two groups of patients. Most of my patients, they really if they really affected by the media, they will say, okay, I want to wait a bit because you know they're just overwhelmed by this number or this just too much news all over the place. But majority of our patients, it's probably because where our practice is, it's a very mature suburb. Most of our patients are over this, this age group. They are well-educated patients. They really read reliable resources. They know the actual numbers. So they come in, they say, I know the risk. So. I want to get vaccinated. I know the benefit and the risk, so I'm aware of it. I know what um, I should get vaccinated. I think as a frontline vaccinator, the, the most frustrating moments is just, I remember the 9th of April, just suddenly this news all over the place. I just heard, okay, AstraZeneca, 50 years of age just cut off that was the most difficult day for me because i have a clinic 160 patients got booked and and suddenly this news just came in there's no there's no official documents from new south Wales health no nope. and everything i heard is just from the news and say okay actually is posed for it just stopped temporarily for people under age of 50. That day was the most difficult day for me, I would say. Like I have 160 patients booked in. They all like me, 
heard the news, I don't have anything on my hand to hand to them from authority, say anything to them. They line up on the door. I don't know whether I should just turn away to them or I should call them one by one and tell them, okay, we got to cancel all your appointments. And the thing is, I understand from the hierarchy point of view, they just want to be safe. But from really small clinic point of view, they make the decision and then they just left us in this dark and we just don't know what to do. We, we dealing with patients face to face every single day. And as, as a GP practice, we are their family doctors. We see their um, parents, we see their kids, their grandkids. And then they will have this question again and again to us. We can't just turn them away, I think. So when you announce something, um, surprisingly, which is fine, but you just give us something beforehand, give us some, you know, heads up. From that moment, I think it's got better. And the patient is so good. The patient has really give us lots of positive feedback. They like, okay, this running really smoothly. Um, you're doing a really good job. Make you feel so good. Like even you really under the pump, you're like, oh my God, I'm, am I like, this is so stressful, this job. It's like, you feel like organizing these things, make organizing the COVID clinic. Um, make sure everything is good, submitting all the vaccination record, everything. And then, but meanwhile, you get lots of um, complaint from patients saying, oh, this is running so smoothly. Well, meanwhile, from uh, like a nurse point of view, you always think, oh, I could have done better. <laughs> and then they bring their, you know, their friends, their families, and then they say, look, um, this clinic, they're doing really good. And then you just feel like, okay, we are doing something to um, end this pandemic or maybe towards to end this pandemic. So you're doing something that makes you feel good. If you would like to hear more nursing stories, make sure you subscribe to the Nursing Australia podcast on your favourite listening app. Or if you want to share your story, get in touch via APNA's socials. APNA's Nurse Support Line provides primary healthcare nurses with access to timely, relevant and accurate advice, resources and referrals. If you need support, please call 1300 303 184. If you're a nurse working in primary healthcare, you'll know that every day is different. And sometimes things can happen that are out of your control. APNA's Professional Indemnity Insurance covers you for everything within your scope of practice except for delivering babies, will satisfy your APRA registration requirements, and covers you for administering the COVID vaccine. We've negotiated a deal with Insurance House so our members can get cost-effective professional indemnity insurance for a small price of only $130 per annum. <laughs> Head to apna.asn.au forward slash insurance and have peace of mind that you're comprehensively protected so you can focus on being the best nurse you can be. I mean, even Tom Cruise wouldn't risk the business of not having adequate insurance coverage. So throughout 2020, APNA ran a series of surveys to get feedback from nurses on the front line during the COVID-19 pandemic. And the survey's back this year to get views of nurses on the vaccine rollout. The results from the first survey are out, and I'm joined by APNA CEO Ken Griffin to discuss. So Ken, tell us about the first pulse check survey for 2021. Thanks, Matthew. We were really blown away by the response to the survey with almost a thousand primary healthcare nurses completing the survey. And what the data is telling us is that nurses right across Australia are taking the lead in really educating patients about the vaccine and also dealing with potential vaccine hesitancy, regardless of whether they're putting needles in arms or not. They're still taking those questions and really doing their bit to build up confidence in the vaccine and the rollout. Overall, nurses felt confident or very confident in providing general education to patients. And what we're really looking forward to is seeing with the ups and downs of the rollout as it gets up ahead of steam, um, how those things change for nurses um, throughout the actual vaccine rollout. 
And so what does the survey tell us about some of the issues that primary healthcare nurses are currently experiencing? Yeah, great question. And no, really no surprises there. The most common issue impacting nurses really is the low supply of COVID-19 vaccine. Um, and also just a general feeling of being tired and burnt out. Now that won't come as a surprise to any primary healthcare nurse out there. But what we need to know is that there is um, action being taken by the government in order to make sure that the supply issues are resolved and that there is support wrapped around nurses to make sure that they can stay the course because this vaccine rollout is going to be a marathon, not a sprint. The survey also painted a really concerning picture of how COVID-19 is having a wider impact on the health of Australians. So of all the nurses who are responding, um, it said that approximately 46% of nurses reported doing less preventative health and screening activities and chronic disease and healthy ageing management was really sort of taking um, a hit. So that means that less preventative health and chronic disease management is taking place in Australia at the moment. And concerningly, about 27% of nurses were saying that there's no plan to pick up on that um, while the vaccine is being rolled out. So we are really expecting a double hit from the pandemic, first with the impact of the pandemic itself, and then second on rates of chronic disease management. And so what's APNA doing with these survey results? Well, I first of all, want to say a big shout out to everyone who spent the time on the survey. It's only um, about eight minutes to do it, but what it means is we can actually speak really clearly and make sure the voice of nurses is heard right into government, especially the team that's running the vaccine rollout at the Commonwealth Department of Health. So we've shared the findings with um, the key ministers and key government officials um, in states and territories, as well as at the Commonwealth. And we're liaising directly with Professor Michael Kidd and the Chief Nursing and Midwifery Officer, Alison McMillan, to make sure that the findings of the survey are heard. And that importantly, throughout this um, pandemic vaccine rollout, that nurses really are valued, visible and respected during the pandemic and beyond. Also, this weekend, the federal budget was released. What should primary healthcare nurses know? So there's plenty of money for health in the budget, but there aren't any game changers. And there's also a lot of devil in the detail here. If you're in aged care, you should be getting a pay rise. You'll certainly be getting retention bonuses, but we can't see the detail as to how that's really going to change to make sure you can give the care you need to those who are in aged care. For every other nurse, what we're essentially waiting for is for the government to back the primary health care 10-year strategy which really needs to be put in place if we're going to truly keep Australians healthy and make sure that nurses can play their role in achieving just that. Thanks for your time, Ken. Thanks, Matthew. APNA will be continuing to survey the primary healthcare nursing workforce over the next six months to track the impacts of the pandemic and the vaccine rollout on the workforce over time. So in the coming weeks, we will be releasing APNA COVID Pulse Check Mark II. We need you to continue to tell us about your experiences on the ground to help inform policy. So please complete this survey, even if you've responded to the last one. So keep an eye on APNA's weekly newsletter, The Connect, for more information. And there's a link to, in the show notes to subscribe to The Connect, if you haven't already. And if you're interested in learning about APNA's response to the federal budget, there's a link in the show notes also, where you can find a full rundown of what it means for primary healthcare nurses. Who has the time to wade through every piece of healthcare news? Primary healthcare nurses certainly don't. Fear not. APNA's Weekly Connect e-newsletter condenses key industry news into digestible content while serving up a feast of useful resources. Stay in the know and save time. Subscribe for free at www.apna.asn.au. So if you have ever been to an APNA annual conference, you'll know that it's the largest event on the calendar for primary care nurses. And we missed out in 2020 due to the pandemic restrictions, but fear not, we are back for 2021. So from September to November this year, APNA is bringing this conference to nurses right across the country as we travel around in a roadshow style format. We're really excited to invite you all to join us and nurses from your state or territory for a program that covers all your favorite nursing topics, legal issues, career pathways, aged care, chronic disease, indigenous and refugee health, immunization, mental health, palliative care, cardiovascular and respiratory health, and of course, interactive wound care workshops. We will also have a select group of exhibitors and reps from your local primary health networks there to meet you. And on top of that, did I mention a birthday party? Because APNA is 20 years old this year, 2021, and we will be celebrating with you at every event. 
And I know from personal experience that participating in a conference, getting there, sorting accommodation can be quite the juggle. So my next guests are here to tell you how scholarships found in the Rural Health Pro database can help you. Rural Health Pro is a community or a network of health professionals across Australia who are passionate about keeping rural communities healthy. It's a platform for nurses to connect with other health professionals and organisations, much like APNA, to connect, share valuable information, resources, training, news and funding. It really enables health professionals to connect with others who are also working rural, uh, rural or remote. A lot of our members can engage by sharing knowledge and resources through the groups and discussion board. So Erin, tell us how the scholarships found in the Rural Health Pro database can help nurses out there. Sure. So Rural Health Pro recently launched a grants and funding database. Uh, it's a fantastic resource full of scholarships and funding opportunities provided by various universities, health sector organisations and government departments. So there are several exciting opportunities available to support eligible nursing and midwifery professionals. So nurses and midwives looking for financial assistance um, to help them pursue their health care education goals can basically visit Rural Health Pro, search for current funding opportunities. Um, they can filter by profession, category, uh, status and even keyword. Um, and it just means that at any difference, whatever stage nurses are at in their professional career, whether they're looking for vocational training, uh, undergraduate study, um, CPD, so con continuing professional development, whether it's postgraduate study or rural placements even, um, as well as research grants, there's lots and lots of um, opportunities that we've basically um, collated into this one, one database, this one space for, for nurses to come and visit and, and search for those. So, Stephen, welcome to the Nursing Australia podcast. Um, tell us about your nursing story. I've started as a uh, nursing student in 2019 here in Port Macquarie. Uh, I'm now third year. Uh, I'm working in the industry as a, an assistant nurse at the moment while I study. I uh, made a placement in rural settings. Uh, the last one was Grafton. And uh, Maury last year as well was also very interesting. Uh, it was promoted through our university at University of Newcastle and through the Rural Doctors Network. Uh, it was a bush bursary scholarship program that I applied for and, and received a grant to go to Deneliquin for two weeks, which is about eight hours west of Sydney. It was a great experience. The town opened up their doors to, to show me and, and a medical student as well. Uh, just really opened up the whole town, exposed the whole town as well as the, the healthcare system there. So, yeah, it was a great experience. So having gone to Deniliquin, has that opened your eyes or made rural nursing uh, a more attractive option for you career-wise? Yeah, I guess when I started studying, it was certainly an idea to – work in remote and rural areas. I'm still interested in that. Um, that was in my, that was after my first year of university, I went to Deniliquin and since then I've sought other rural placements. So Grafton, uh, Maury, Wingham, down near Taree, just really enjoying those rural placements to get a, a, a great feel for, for rural nursing, yeah. The, the grant that you got uh, with the assistance of Rural Health Pro, how did that ease the burden for you? Did, if you didn't have that grant, would you have been able to have done undertaken these rural experiences? No, I guess as a student, uh, money's a bit tight, so it was definitely um, very welcome to receive that grant. Um, it paid for the petrol to get out there. And, um, yeah, food. Um, the town put us up. They put us up in um, a doctor's house a doctor put us up there and also a council worker was up for a week so we had free accommodation on top of the grant money but yeah it certainly went a long way every day was something different i was in the doctor's surgeries i was in the hospital i was in the ed setting there um in the medical wards and then i was with the vet for two days it was just a really good broad experience and also the town kind of opened up and showed us what the town had to offer as well. So we got into sporting events, uh, a triathlon, 
and we went boating, uh, we went on a houseboat. So, yeah. It was just a great experience. I'd have to um, agree with Steve, especially in terms of the rural placement opportunities. Um, I think it's um, it's such a unique experience to go into some of these rural or remote areas. Um, I think the sense of community, um, the collaborative learning environments, um, such a positive clinical experience. Uh, people are so welcoming in the organisations and the town itself. The exposure to a range of patient conditions and the opportunities to learn is far greater. Um, obviously, there's um, a good example for for nurses, you know, working in a smaller area where they need to sort of be supporting other health professionals and they would just be exposed to a lot more than they might be if they were in a, in a smaller organisation in a metropolitan area. And the sense of community, I think, is, is a real plus when you're learning, as a, especially as a student or, you know, while you're doing placements. Um, that's obviously got a huge, huge amount of benefit. Okay, Erin, with the 2021 APNA Conference Roadshow on the horizon, how can Rural Health Pro help our nurses, nursing students and our members to get along to the conference? Yeah, so nurses can go and visit the um, the grants and funding um, directory on Rural Health Pro. Um, there's, a, there's a whole lot of grants available, including nurse, nursing and midwifery undergraduate clinical placement grants. Um, there's bush bursaries provided by New South Wales Rural Doctors Network. So um, all the details are there. Um, they can go on, apply for that. And, you know, hopefully that leads them to be able to, to head off to APNA's Roadshow. So we have included links for the 2021 APNA Conference Roadshow registrations and Rural Health Pro Scholarships database in the show notes of this episode. Make sure you check it out. We do hope to see you there at the Conference Roadshow. For more information on Rural Health Pro, please visit www.ruralhealthpro.org. Nursing Australia, the podcast for Australian nurses working together towards a healthier Australia. Who hasn't had a tough conversation at work, especially as a nurse? And as our workloads grow, we often find it hard to say no. So today we have Margaret Smith from Inspirational Coaching to give us some tips on tackling courageous conversations at work, setting those boundaries and valuing our time and expertise so we become visible, valued and respected by our colleagues and managers. Margaret has 18 years experience as a learning and development facilitator in the public service and private sector. Here is some of Margaret's wisdom for nurses. Hi everyone. So I thought it might be interesting to talk about something I hear a lot from my female clients and friends, particularly those in the caring industry, talking about feeling underappreciated and undervalued. Sound familiar? Being asked to do additional work because they're lovely and always say yes. Putting up with poor behaviour by others because it wouldn't be nice to give them feedback. Not getting the recognition, support, acknowledgement and even the dollars that we deserve because I'm putting up with it because I'm just uh, whatever. So let's talk about some tips and tricks and let's get started and how we can do that. First, let's tackle how other people are behaving. We all know the only person I can really change is myself. So first of all, we need to look at how I'm currently handling the situation. And the dilemma comes with examples like this. When I'm being asked to stay back late or help out someone beyond the scope of my work, How often do I just say, okay? And in all fairness, then the other person's been given the green light to walk away and leave me to get get on with it, or probably even the green light to ask me again. So something I hear my clients saying, they should know how much, that person should actually know how much is on my plate, or they should know that I've got kids to pick up from school. And whilst this might be true, the only true way of them knowing is by being able to say no and set boundaries. Wow, I can already hear the moans and that sense of people shaking their heads going, no, I can't do that. So let's talk about how we can do that. I think there are three ways, well, three tips that we can get started with. One is to get comfortable with saying no and practicing that particularly with the people around us that love us and the ones that we capitulate to the most. Think about things like when you're sitting down to watch television and the other person says, you're okay to watch the footy, aren't you? What would it feel like to just say no? The more we get to say no, the more comfortable we get at doing it with the situations that really count. But the second tip here is you may not feel comfortable just using that word no. 
try and find some words that are going to work for you. Try some of these. I'd prefer not to. Not now, thank you. I'm sorry, I really don't have time right now. Or is there someone else that could do that for you? One of the hints I've got for you is to listen to how other people say no and start to mimic them, copy them, because if they're doing it well, you could learn from that. I have a funny story with that. I do this as my profession and as a parent, it came back to bite me. My son one day when he was oh, maybe seven or eight years old, I said to him, could you take the garbage bin out? And he turned to me and said, I prefer not to. <laughs> so I know that it works. The other thing is to think about saying no by negotiating. We can use that if and them technique. If I watch the footy now, can we watch a movie afterwards? Or if I take on this task ongoingly, can we set a time to discuss my overall workload? Again, knowing that you can say yes, but not giving in completely by getting something that you want as well. Thanks, Margaret. Included in the show notes of this episode is two of Margaret's favorite TED Talks and the link to the Inspirational Coaching website where you can find out more information. And a shout out to all our APNA members who have received the Foundations of Change conversation and negotiation in the workplace as our gift to you when you renewed your membership for 2021. This course is for all of us who need to consolidate and gain the courage we need to tackle those difficult conversations at work. Don't forget, if you are listening to Nursing Australia on Apple or Google Podcasts, please don't forget to tap the subscribe button. And on Spotify, click to follow. So next time on Nursing Australia, we're getting ready to hit the road and discover more about the upcoming APTA Conference Roadshow for 2021. And also we're exploring the latest tech available in diabetes management. Thanks for listening to Nursing Australia. Nursing Australia, the podcast for Australian nurses working together towards a healthier Australia. For more information, please visit us at www.apna.asn.au.